So morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Improve Healthcare Commissioning through Deeper Insights. We've got quite a lot of content to fit into the session today, and I make it 11.02. So we will get going with the webinar. Um, we will be recording this. So if you do join slightly late, you can catch up on that and we share it after the session. So just to give a brief introduction, I'm Georgina Carter, Customer Success Manager here at Esri. And in terms of an agenda, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to introduce Esri UK and set the scene for the rest of the webinar. Then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Adam Lee, who's one of Esri UK's product managers, and will be taking us through how you can enhance data management and gain valuable insights from your health data utilising a data observatory. Then I'm del delighted to hand over to James Lewis, Head of Geospatial, and Bryony Cook, Principal Geospatial Analyst from the UK Health Security Agency, who are going to be speaking to us about some of the work they do, including their recent pilot project, which looked at assigning vulnerability to LSOAs against different climate scenarios. Finally, my colleague Nikita Sobolev, Customer Success Consultant, will be demonstrating how you can analyse travel times to determine patient access to services and then use this to improve access. We will have some time at the end for questions. So just a bit of housekeeping, please do keep microphones off throughout the webinar. And as you can see, we have a Slido link set up for any questions. So do please ask any questions as we go, either by following the QR code on screen or by visiting www.slido.com with the event code ESRI0705. So I'll just leave that up on the screen for a few moments for you to follow that. So I'm aware that some of you will be familiar with Esri UK, but others may be less so. So I wanted to provide a brief overview of who we are just to set the scene. So Esri are the global leaders in location intelligence with over 350,000 customers around the world utilizing our mapping and spatial analytics technology. So we work across many sectors with a, a number of organizations, but today we're gonna to be speaking to you about providing a geographic approach to health. So health challenges are inherently spatial, so utilizing location intelligence allows you to unlock deeper insights and help improve commissioning. We work with a wide range of healthcare organizations from CSUs, ICBs, health boards, trusts, and charities. And utilizing GIS software, these organizations can better analyze data and identify place-based challenges, enabling a more informed response. So there are many ways that Esri UK can help you empower health and social care, but we tend to break them down into four key areas. So population health management to focus on reducing inequalities by better understanding demographics and shifting towards a preventative approach to healthcare. Care coordination to improve access to services and deliver efficient and effective tra service transformation. Estates and facilities management to optimize operations through space management and asset tracking. And finally, sustainability and net zero by providing you with the tools you need to track things like air quality, temperature, CO2 levels, but also allowing you to better utilize and understand your natural capital. So the challenges the NHS face are well understood from the pressure of growing waiting lists and clinical backlogs, widening health inequalities and managing changing health needs, staff shortages, space challenges, and the prolonged lack of funding versus increased demand for services, just to name a few. So how can you utilize geospatial insights to help combat some of these challenges and improve health outcomes? I'm gonna walk you through just a couple of examples at a really high level to showcase how you can utilize location intelligence. To firstly, become preventative and drive actionable insights. So this was done in this example commissioned by NHS South Central and West, on behalf of Sussex ICB, and it looked at bowel cancer screening rates in the area to evaluate certain areas of concern. Understanding demographic trends and reducing inequalities. So this example looked at fuel poverty across London, providing a stronger understanding of who was at risk, but critically where these people were located to help inform response. Improving access and optimizing resources. So the first national picture of mental health mapping, you may be familiar with this example, and it provides a really strong understanding of local access and demand issues. And finally, optimizing natural capital to improve well-being. So here an NHS site is being tracked specifically for green space and to look at green space areas, 
which could then be used for social prescribing or perhaps just wellbeing purposes for staff and patients in the hospital. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Adam, who's going to be taking you through how you can unlock community insights and enhance data management utilising data observatories. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Georgina. Um, so, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name's Adam Lee, and as Georgina said, I'm a, a product manager here at Esri UK for our Instant Atlas set of products and services. Um, and today I'm going to be talking you through one of those offerings, the, the Data Observatory. So in terms of what I'm going to cover over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm uh, going to take a brief look at what actually is Instant Atlas, just for a little bit of context. Um, and then we'll go into what is a, an Azure UK data observatory, what those benefits are, how we actually deliver those benefits to you. And then I'll also go in and do a little demo as well. So just to start with, what is Instant Atlas? So Instant Atlas is a set of Esri UK products and services, uh, and it can be broken down into these three key offerings. So the first of those is the one that we're going to focus on today, which is the data observatory. Uh, but then we also have the national data service. So that's Esri UK's data as a service offering, um, which we'll also cover in a little bit more detail later. Uh, and then finally, report builder for ArcGIS. So today I don't have time to go into Report Builder in much detail. And so just to let you know that it's a Esri UK application um, that allows you to create virtually any type of report um, in ArcGIS Online um, with little or, or no code. Um, and this can be simple sort of one page fact sheets uh, right through to really sort of complex multi-page reports. But the, the focus today is the, the data observatory. And so what actually is the Esri UK data observatory? And so it's a, it's a combination of services and applications used to deliver a, an off the shelf data observatory as a managed service. So this allows you to create an accurate picture of your area of interest. So that could be a local authority, um, a commissioning support unit, a region, or, or the entire country. Um, that allows you to efficiently share information um, across key stakeholders or the public, um, which then allows you to better target services that are important to you. Um, and then finally, by having that single source of truth, uh, one place for that data, it removes the duplication of effort as it stops data being in multiple places used by multiple different people. In terms of what are some of the benefits of a data observatory, so managing your own data observatory and the underlying data that comes with it uh, can be really complex and time consuming. And so Esri UK takes that burden away from you and manages the data and the website for you. Um, by managing the data updates, you get easy access to timely quality data, uh, which allows your stakeholders, your analysts, um, and the public to make better, more evidence-based decisions. Um, and what we do find as well, for example, is that lots of our data observatory customers use the data observatory to easily deliver uh, their JSNA. The, we also uh, help you enable data as data infrastructure. So again, going back to what I said previously, um, having that single source of truth putting data at the heart of what you do, um, the data observatory allows you to do that. And then again, by giving us all of that responsibility for you, this minimizes your overall cost of delivering it yourself. So how does Esri UK actually deliver these benefits? Uh, so we do that in four key ways. So firstly, through the National Data Service, then through a set of pre-built reports for some key themes and geographies, through a fully hosted website that allows you to explore the data and those reports in more detail, and then optionally through us managing any additional data uh, that you may want in that site that we don't have currently. So if we just take a, a little look at some of those um, 
benefits in a bit more detail. So first we have the National Data Service. So this is a managed catalogue of close to 16,000 statistical indicators from a variety of, of government sources. And you can see some of the, the logos on the screen at the moment. So we've got ONS data in there, including the, the most recent census. We've got data from DHSC um, and DLUC as well. Um, this, or we've put this into some key themes. So this covers things like population, health, deprivation, through to children and young people. Um, and we provide that data at a range of, of standard geographies. So this goes from sort of country and region right down to LSOA level if the data is provided from the source at that level. And then all of this data um, is stored in ArcGIS Online and shared with you as a set of feature services, which means you can use it anywhere else within the ArcGIS system. We also provide you with a set of pre-built reports. So these are built using Report Builder for ArcGIS, and these are managed and maintained by Esri UK for all the key themes and geographies that I mentioned on the, on the previous slide. If you want to take it a step further and start creating your own reports, uh, you can absolutely do this. Um, you would just need to purchase a Report Builder license, and then you can go and start building your own custom reports. Next, we have the, the hosted website. So again, completely managed and maintained by Esri UK. As you can see from the screenshots here of Merton, we brand it to meet your organization's guidelines. And then we also include what we call some Explorer applications, which are various ways for you to access and visualize um, all that data coming from the National Data Service. Um, again, if you want to take that a step further, we do also provide you with access to the, the website's back end, so you can start adding in your own pages and content too, if you wish. And then finally, we understand that the data observatory off the shelf uh, may not meet all your needs um, for different geographies and data sets that you might want included. And so you can also provide us with additional geographies and data sets um, that you would like included, and we can add those in for you. So custom geographies could include things like primary care networks, ICSs, commissioning support units, um, and then local data sets that could include sort of health indicators that you might, might collect locally, or we've got some educational attainment results there as well. So hopefully that's been a, a useful introduction, um, but I thought I'd also like to show you this in action. So I've got a few examples to run through. So here we have one of our fairly standard out-the-box observatories um, from the Royal Borough of Greenwich. Um, and as you can see straight away, you know, we've been able to add in some of their branding guidelines around their logo and following the, the colour scheme in the in the charts. In terms of what's on the on the home page, we have a, a quick ward profile map which allows you to view award and if you click into that it will produce a report for that for that area. Uh, we also have some key key overview statistics um, which you can change if you'd like um, and we have ways of viewing the the key themes that I mentioned earlier. If we then just go back to the top and the data tab um, you can do view those themes again and so if we go into the health and social care theme This then loads up one of those pre-built reports that I mentioned earlier. So here we have a health report for, for Greenwich as a whole. Um, and if you start scrolling through, you can start to see the different types of charts, graphs, text and tables that you can include within these reports. If you then go into the reports tab, you can start to break that report down into different geographies. And so here we can now select wards, pick a ward that we're interested in. And as you might have been able to see there, the data updates accordingly. I also mentioned earlier that we have a few different um, Explorer applications to visualize the data in different ways. And so if I just go through those, the first one is the Map Explorer.
So here you can go in, you can select the geography you're interested in, the date, and then pick one of those um, 16,000 indicators. So here focusing just on, on health. So if we look at very bad health, you'll see that the map updates and you can even change how the data is visualized on the map. You can then go in and look at the, the raw data, download that data, or look at the metadata if, if of interest. One of the other tools is the Data Explorer. Uh, so the Data Explorer is a great tool to try and look through one of those 16,000 indicators that I mentioned. And so the easiest way to do that is to go and filter. So here you can filter by the theme that we're interested in, the geography again, and who's published that data. So if we just click in on the on the first one here, again, you get shown the metadata, the data in table format, which you can download. Uh, we can also configure this page to include a button to take you off to the item in ArcGIS Online, um, if that's of interest. can then view again that data on a map as a time series graph or a ranked bar chart. The final tool I wanted to show was the custom area reporter and as the name suggests it allows you to pick a custom area of interest for you. So here if I'm interested in Woolwich Common I can roughly draw the shape of Woolwich Common it will select the LSOAs that I've intersected with. If I realized I've made a mistake, I can go ahead and delete one of those areas. And then I can go and generate one of those overview reports on the fly. And once generated, you can see that it, it does it for those selected areas and compares it to Greenwich, and in this case, England, but these can be changed as well. Um, and you can go ahead and print that report if you'd like. So that's the sort of standard off the shelf data observatory. But as I mentioned, um, we find that customers do like to sort of go a step further and add their own pages, add their own content. And so if I just show you a, a couple of examples of this. So here we have London Borough of Hounslow, who as you can see from all the different menu bars have added in um, a lot more, a lot more information, a lot more pages. Um, so, for example, they've added in the state of the borough dashboard, and what they've done here is they've embedded Power BI um, into the site, which you can do. Um, as you can see here, they've then got a nice Power BI report that they've they've built into the site. They've also added their health and well-being strategy, um, which simply just links off to their own their own council website um, and allows you to download download a PDF. Um, but what, what I quite like is that if we go back to the health and social care theme and look at the reports, Hounslow are one of those customers that have um, given us the primary care network as a custom geography. And so we can go in and start to get updated reports for those primary care networks. Another customer uh, that's taken the observatory a bit further is North East Lincolnshire. So they've combined the observatory alongside building some of their own custom reports using Report Builder for ArcGIS and have done that to build up a report for their JSNA. So here, if I go into their report, you can see they've started to build out a really nice report using Report Builder that includes text images but then also some charts um, built using report builder and powered by the, the national data service data underneath that so just to summarize what we've discussed um, we've primarily focused on on what a data observatory is um, alongside how we as UK will deliver that to you um, alongside some of the benefits 
Um, if you want any information on any of the Instant Atlas products um, that I've covered today, um, I've got the links there on the slides. Um, and if you have any further questions, feel free to email me at the email address there. Back to you, Georgina. Brilliant, thank you, Adam. It's really great to see how you can better utilise health data with an up-to-date single source of the truth that then in turn helps you save time on data management and the costs associated with that as well. So thank you for that. I'm now going to hand over to James and Bryony at UKHSA who are going to be talking us through some of the work they do and a particular pilot project around assigning vulnerability against different climate scenarios. So James, Bryony, over to you. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Hope, can everyone hear me okay and see the slides? Yep, all good, James. Thank you. Cool. Great. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, my name's James Lewis. I'm the head of the... Uh, sorry. One second. I'm the head of the uh, geospatial team and the UKHSA geography profession at the UK Health Security Agency. And I'm presenting with um, Bryony Cook uh, this morning, who's principal geospatial analyst uh, within my team. And we're going to talk to you about some work that we've been doing with the Centre for Climate Health Security at the UK HSA um, around um, provi provision of um, mapping support vulnerability um, to the impact of climate change um, for local action. So I'm going to start by focusing on, I'm just going to give you a potted history of um, the geospatial team and geospatial um, in terms of uh, its various guises uh, in public health over the last sort of 15, 20 years. I'm then going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing to build geospatial capability and, uh, and where the Esri platform sits in that. And then I'm going to hand over to Bryony to focus on the, uh, the work we've been doing with the uh, Centre for Climate Health Security. So um, th there's been significant change uh, in public health over the last 20 years. Um, so I joined, uh, I've been working in public health since 2007, but a couple of years prior to joining, um, the organisation was called the Health Protection Agency, uh, an executive agency of Department for Health and Social Care. And um, it was when uh, the, it was when the sort of GIS team um, was formed in 2005 to support teams within the microbial risk assessment uh, division. So uh, medical entomologists, um, mathematical modelers and uh, scientific computing. Um, and GIS was uh, very much sort of the traditional uh, function at the time, but very quickly and in 2007, about around about when I joined, um, there was a, a, a need to move towards a more centralized approach for geospatial. Um, so in collaboration with chemicals and radiations colleagues at, uh, in Oxfordshire at Chilton, um, we started to put together um, centralised data and centralised tools, the ESRI platform, to make GIS accessible and to ensure its integration uh, across um, parts of the organisation. Um, moving forward to 2009, uh, the the uh, the geospatial team, the GIS team, supported the H1N1 response, and moving further ahead to 2013 um, was the first sort of iteration of the organisation. Um, so the, the Health Protection Agency uh, merged with public health observatories, but also cancer registries, to form Public Health England or PHE. And it was then that we started to really consider the work that had been done in the last few years to bring geospatial together in a in a in a in a structured and centralized format. And there were some key um, elements to that, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the first was um, the start of an enterprise agreement with ESRI. Um, so removing the barriers of um, you know, team and divisional costs associated with GIS software and moving towards a, a centralized enterprise agreement, um, making it more um, a ubiquitous platform across the organization. That then served as the foundation in 2015 to um, create the first uh, GIS strategy for Public Health England. 
And over the, the next few years, we worked hard to build that centralized approach, geospatial data, geospatial tools, and geospatial expertise to support all hazards. That came to, can, can I just check, you can't see the, you can't see the meeting window in my, on my slides, can you? No, we can just, just see the slides, James, you're all good. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so there should be a date on that to uh, 2020. Um, so the COVID-19 response pandemic started, and we uh, the, the work we'd done prior to that to, to put a centralised approach in place for geospatial served us well for the pandemic response. So being able to serve uh, dashboards uh, and address validation and cartographic tools to the organisation to inform um, an efficient response to the pandemic, and then in 2021. Uh, another iteration of the organisation, so Public Health England, um, together with the Joint Biosecurity Centre, which was a, a dedicated data capability for the Cabinet Office, um, formed in the early stages of the, the pandemic response, and NHS Test and Trace, all three functions came together to form uh, the UK Health Security Agency in 2021. And, and from there, for the last two to three years, we've been looking at how we develop geospatial um, within the organisation. And just to highlight here that Esri's played a key role and it's been a common thread. We, we've, there's been a lot of uh, changes to the organisation, uh, the name, the structure, but as a team Esri's played a key role and it's been a common thread um, over the last 15 to 20 years. So supporting the initial development of a GIS team through to developing centralised capability, uh, the enterprise agreement and finally um, allowing the team and allowing the organization to apply geospatial data and techniques to the COVID-19 response. So just a quick overview of the goals and priorities of UKHSA. Um, three key priorities around preparation, being ready for and preventing future health security hazards, uh, responding, saving lives and reducing harm through effective health security response, and building, making sure that as a new organisation and following um, the lessons learned from COVID-19 that we build, um, and develop the UK's health security capacity. And geospatial is, again, is a common thread through each of those, being able to um, provide the data and services that allow us to accurately code surveillance systems in preparation for a response, making sure that we have the data and the tools um, available and, and ready to use when they're needed in response to uh, infectious disease, but also um, environmental impacts on population health like um, climate change. And finally, being able to build. So making sure that as a geospatial team, we're putting geography, no pun intended, on the map to ensure it's fully integrated within um, the organization. And cross-cutting across all of those is um, making sure that um, we apply geography to achieve more equitable outcomes. And socioeconomic geography are key factors in ensuring that we reduce health um, inequality um, for uh, the population. So since 2021, we've been working hard to um, place geospatial and develop the capability. Um, in 2022, we've partnered with Ordnance Survey to develop a geospatial unified approach um, with three functional goals. Um, one being to improve geospatial infrastructure uh, and data engineering, um, develop standardized geospatial products, um, and thirdly, to lead on and develop uh, a geospatial analytics research and insights capability called GARI. Now, a, a, around all of those, we have some enabling capabilities. So, um, as I said, uh, head of the UKHSA geography profession, we're, we're looking to develop that community. And collaboration is key to what we do as well. We, we fully acknowledge we're an enabling capability that supports all hazards um, across multiple teams and groups within the organisation but extending that to make sure we, we collaborate with external partners um, where appropriate. And wrapping the whole geospatial team in the standards and governance um, needed to ensure that we deliver an efficient and effective um, geospatial function. So just before I, um, just before I um, hand over to Brian, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview, very quick overview of some of the use cases for um, the ESRI platform um, within um, UK HSA. Um, so we partner with the British Geological Survey um, to provide um, radon risk probability mapping um, to the public. So if you are um, if you're buying a house and you're going through conveyancing, uh, being able to check the radon um, risk in your area and then 
uh, being able to access advice on how to carry out any mitigation needed um, depending on the risk. Um, we also uh, provide lots of capability around data collection, so the use of collector and field maps for <coughs> excuse me, um, medical entomologists collecting information about tick and mosquito locations um, uh, and associated um, vector-borne disease. And um, bottom right, uh, quickly, again, emphasizing the, the need and, and the benefit of having a, a centralized approach to geospatial, having the platforms, the data in place, um, quickly allowed us to respond to um, a need for a public facing dashboard in, in the very early stages uh, of the COVID-19 response. Um, so moving on to climate change, uh, Centre for Climate and Health Security, just before I hand over. So the Centre for Climate and Health Security, or CCHS, uh, it's a division within the science group uh, in UKHSA. It feeds into the science strategy and to the science development. Um, and it has a primary role to provide scientific advice and support um, locally, nationally, internationally, to ensure that the effects of climate change and extreme weather <coughs> are considered and integrated into the public health system design. So three key areas of work, um, increasing awareness of the impacts of climate change, uh, developing the evidence base concerning the impacts of climate change, and mobilizing that evidence to inform uh, policy design and, and local action. Um, so the, the center recently uh, in December 2023 um, published the health effects of climate change, the HEC report, um, and our team's been working closely with them as I'm now going to pass over to Bryony to talk about the uh, vulnerability mapping that we've been supporting. Yeah, um, yeah, so morning everyone, if you go to the next slide, James. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about a pilot study we ran with um, the Centre for Climate and Health Security, um, South Gloucestershire and University of Bristol. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so in December 2022, it was a working group was put together, um, as I mentioned, with the University of Bristol, South Gloucestershire Local Authority and colleagues from UK HSA in geospatial and um, in the Centre for climate change and health security, but also I think wider across the science group as well. Um, because it was noted that local authorities required a quantitative approach to vulnerability across a population in relation to climate hazards. And it was hoped that this increased intelligence would empower partnership working with both organizations and communities. Um, so metrics were developed to, de to map the vulnerability of populations to climate related hazards, to facilitate local authority adaptation and resilience building. And as part of the initial work, um, a proof of concept using ArcGIS Enterprise was created and it was decided that developing this further and creating a pilot on the usefulness of an application to support local action should take place. So this took place um, from September 23 to April 2024. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so just quickly on the data that is feeding that. So four domain, domains of the vulnerability index were created, um, adap adaptive capacity, health, environment and sensitivity. Um, so these are actually split into subdomains, including income, language, age, and the condition of the living environment. So 12, overall 12 subdomains make up these four domains. Um, so in this pilot study and the, the sort of wider study that, that came before this, flood, flood risk and heat risk um, were the key climate risks for this pilot. So flooding was determined by two scenarios, a disaster and a typical flood event, and heat had two indicators. So average daily temperatures for that area, but also an indicator determining where the proportion of the summer period that the population was experiencing temperatures above which mortality risks um, in southwest England increased. So as part of kind of the requirements gathering for the app, we looked at the areas that it needed to support. So on the next slide, um, this is just an indication of kind of those areas that it might support within the local authority. So supporting things like the development of the local plan, targeting the rollout of um, 
urban tree planting and targeted training for health and social care providers, as well as targeted comms for residents, for example, prior to heatwave alerts or planning the location of rest centres, including within schools and supporting wider engagement with communities. Um, it also looked at potentially feeding into other policies, so supporting conversations around what constitutes an at-risk area, um, enabling discussions with local resilience forums and ICBs around resilience planning um, and discussions regarding the locations of vulnerable settings, but also potentially in, um, supporting more targeted things like the Clean Air Action Plan and supporting work on the cost of living crisis. Um, so we knew what areas that it might support, but we needed kind of requirements for the visualisation um, all told. So on the next slide, um, we put together some sort of high level requirements. So it needed to be interactive. It needed to bring the tabular data that was created by the University of Bristol to life and allow users to, so, to centre this on their local area. Um, so the ability to add local information was key. Um, we had to look into options for secured cross-partner access um, and it, the app needed to be intuitive and provide a narrative around what the met metrics meant. It was clear from um, the areas of support that these wouldn't target individual level responses and would be more community or policy or intervention, uh, community or policy level interventions, so providing the data at a local layer super output area was sufficient and provided a good basis for decision making. Um, so on the next slide, I'll talk a bit about the process. Um, so I mentioned the secure cross partner access. Now the original proof of concept was created in our ArcGIS enterprise, which doesn't have the ability to share externally in our, in our infrastructure. Um, so we looked at using ArcGIS online for this. Um, we also looked at using iterative, an iterative development sort of process, engaging with stakeholders in South Gloucestershire and UK HSA. Um, and that was really useful because it was really clear that the users would benefit from it being the application being more than a straight web map. And I mentioned earlier the narrative, so providing them with detail on the mapping pages of the background of the data and explanations about the meaning of the number they were seeing. Um, so ArcGIS Online allowed us to use instant apps, um, providing a targeted and intuitive application, but not overwhelming it with map elements that wouldn't be clear to users that were less used to working with data in this way. Um, so the iterative development also allowed us to support the sourcing of contextual data. It allowed us to show the benefit of having that local information as part of the application and engage with um, South Gloucestershire's GIS teams to ensure that we had better data access um, as we use their service locations rather than open source data. So they took the ownership of the requirement for that data. So we had, we incorporated things like schools, care homes, primary and secondary care sites, ambulance stations and prisons. Um, so ArcGIS Online and Instant Apps allowed us to add map elements that supported the narrative um, requirement I mentioned earlier. So if we go to the next slide, I think, yeah, an extra, yeah. So this is the what the application looks like. I can't give you a demo today um, because the data isn't public, but you can see sort of classic map, map elements on there. So there is a legend with the key of what all of the data means. Um, there's a search facility that allows um, people to centre it within their local area can look at specific areas that might um, specific places that might not have been added. Um, there are seven maps in total, so we've done this as a tab, so people can sort of click through and see see what what information they get. Um, if you click again, James, there's each map also had a note on it. So this was an instant app. Um, functionality that uh, we, I say we, Jamie Dalton and my team <laughs> created this mostly, so I'm presenting on his behalf, but um, that we hadn't seen before. So it allowed each map to have a note about the specific data that was being shown there. So there was no ambiguity about what you were seeing. It popped up um, as soon as you opened that map, 
you could hide it, but it would pop up again as soon as you went in there. Um, Arcade, which is shown on the other side of the page, in the pop-ups allowed us to provide that narrative um, for the LSOA, so it wasn't just numbers that didn't mean anything to the user. In this case, it was particularly important as the it's all a relative scale, so the other area is impacted on the area you were looking at. Um, and then one more click. Yeah, so the last thing we did was create a story map which provided both a user guide, so explain those map elements to people that didn't necessarily know um, what an interactive mapping application looked like, but also provided the background information to the indexes um, or the indices, the data layers that you were seeing there, um, and each individual map um, in a much more narrative way. Um, so this was a six month study and we had participants from across the council, including public health planning and emergency response taking part. Surveys were con conducted um, throughout the period on the usefulness of the data as well as the usefulness of the application. So I mentioned earlier that pilot finished about two weeks ago, so we haven't got any sort of feedback or findings on on the impact of this, but it is being, currently being collated and will hopefully be published in the future so that there will be more detail on how the data was created and the impact of the work available soon. Um, that is the NCF. You go to the next, last slide, James. Um, so if you have any questions, the slide is there, um, but our contact details are there as well. So please get in touch. But I will hand back to Georgina. Brilliant. Thank you, James and Bryony, for that, you know, really insightful overview of the work you've been doing. I think the the pilot project shows really nicely the value, how much how the value of location intelligence for health planning in terms of who is most at risk, but where they're located, especially in the potential areas of support you spoke through. So I'm now going to finally hand over to Nikita, who's going to be walking us through how you can analyze patient travel times to determine access to services. So over to you, Nikita. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita. And yes, I will be taking you through a little workflow that you might be able to go through if you wanted to figure out how to best reconfigure your services. Now, by way of introduction, we know that the NHS backlogs are a very big and complex issue, but we know also that transport issues and transport access are contributing to these. Because if somebody has to travel for far too long or far too far, they will miss appointments. They will be less likely to turn up for screening because sometimes screening isn't necessarily something that hurts them right now the second. So it's not quite as urgent as in their mind. And also, access isn't equal. It, it affects different people differently based on where they live. And so how do we look at this picture? And what can we do to make sure that this access is as good as we can make it? Now, today, I will be taking you through a hypothetical scenario. And uh, we, we have simplified it. You can build in a lot of different factors into how you reconfigure your services, but we've kept it relatively simple specifically for today. And of course, all the data is simulated. You can see the boundaries of the care boards, hospital locations, patient locations, etc. But today we will be looking at just cardiology and endocrinology services. And how would we reconfigure our services to improve access for residents? That will look generally. This is the boundary of our care board. Um, you can see the variety of different hospitals. They, if we're looking at cardiology specifically, the hearts are the hospitals with a cardiology department. The blue squares are other hospitals that are available. The red lines represent the travel distance of each patient that would need to go in for their cardiology service. If it's a green line, they don't have to travel very far. If it's a red line, they have to travel quite a long distance. 
Same goes for endocrinology. You can see again, we've got a number of endocrinology facilities, a number of hospitals, and people that need to travel further or closer depending on where they live. Cardiology, as an example, to start with. What we'll be able to see is the fact that if we look at Market Harbor, for example, a lot of people have decent coverage. The people that need to travel to this specific hospital, this being the nearest hospital to them, most of them are green lines. They're not traveling very far. But if we zoom out, we can see that over in this eastern area of our care board, there is a gap. There is a hospital there, but it doesn't have a cardiology department. And so a lot of people are having to travel quite a long way away and even possibly outside of their care board because the nearest hospital is actually elsewhere. So we can also take a look at very specific patients. So at this point, I was showing you as the crow flies distances, which give us a general overview. But if we look at patient A, let's call him Stephen. He needs cardiology access, just routine checkups really, and he lives about 500 meters away from his nearest facility. And that seven minute walk, two minute drive, he can take public transport. He has a variety of different options that he can take to visit his appointment. It's very easy to access. But if we look at somebody else, a patient B, let's call him James. He's recovering from a heart attack and he needs to make regular visits. Now, the orange line is the journey he would have to take by public transport. That's almost two hours in one way. And then he has to get back. That's four hours of traveling or 30 minutes of driving if he has access to a car. And that's, that's complications. That's a lot of complications, really. So this person is at risk of missed appointments and, as a result, poor health outcomes. Now, if we look at endocrinology, the picture is slightly different, but you can see, generally speaking, we're doing okay, but the southern side of our care board is missing an endocrinology service, although we do have a hospital right here that is within our boundary. But people are having to travel quite far away. And this is what we're seeing with our patient C, Melissa, who has diabetes, who has to travel every few months for checks, but she doesn't drive. So what options does she have? She can take over an hour by public transport to go through Bicester over to Buckingham, making a huge dog leg and taking several connecting modes of transport, which could be unreliable. A bus may be late and should miss her connection or it might not turn up at all. The taxi ride would be about 15 minutes, but taxis are quite expensive. So she would struggle getting to her appointment. And what can we do for her? Well, we can start looking at how we can reconfigure our services. Looking at cardiology. Beforehand, we had a lot of patients missing out on cardiology services on the eastern side. But what happens if we add a hospital right here? You can start seeing immediately that where we had a lot of people traveling long distances, all of a sudden, they are very close to their hospital. They're now way closer to their facility and we're taking the load off of these two facilities here and also from a hospital that's outside of our care board. So suddenly, not only are people traveling less, but we're also spreading the load across the ICB. And now, if we look at our patient B, he has a cardiology department in his town that takes him 25 minutes by public transport, five minute drive, 40 minute walk. What does this give us? Well, this gives us a reduction in carbon footprint. We are all having to be a lot more aware about that but it also gives us better health outcomes for our patients, fewer missed appointments, better experiences. Could our patient tie in a visit to his cardiologist into other errands that they may be running because now he's just going into town really, not that big a deal. And the same goes for endocrinology. 
you can see that beforehand we are missing a lot of care down at the south side and suddenly we're seeing people traveling far less you can immediately see a great change in the people in the distance that people are having to travel to their nearest facility and that results in our patient C taking 20 minutes instead of over an hour by public transport or a 30 minute walk or cycle if she wanted to and overall that reduces travel costs in terms of money yes but also travel costs in terms of time in terms of stress in terms of effort that has to be put in maybe she works in Brackley and therefore going to work and then taking a lunchtime appointment becomes a far more viable option for her so therefore we can take a look at what we do with our services in a far wider manner first of all we can look as the crow flies identify who's having to travel very far we can take a look at where our hotspots and our missing facilities are but we can then take a look at varieties of transport modes and understand how can people get to the facilities that they may be going to what are they likely to do how are they likely to get there so we have a much clearer picture and we have much better insight into our coverage and then we start looking at service accessibility accounting for geographic barriers because if we're looking at wales for example famously there are welsh valleys that as the crow flies you may be 500 meters away okay maybe not 500 meters, but uh, you may be not that far away from your nearest facility but if you have to take public transport this may be a very challenging journey and so overall what this results in is a more informed and more patient-centered response that leads to better outcomes for everybody better patient experiences better patient outcomes and for us a more efficient service thank you very much i shall pass you over to georgina Brilliant. Thank you, Nikita. Hopefully my screen's coming through again. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great to see how patient travel time could provide commissioners with valuable insight in regards to, you know, where communities can and cannot easily access services to help, again, inform response. So now we're at the final part of our webinar. We've got a couple of minutes left. We're a little bit tight for time, but we've got a few minutes to go over any questions. We've had a few via Slido, so do please, if you have any more questions, feel free to either follow the QR code or use the event code ESRI0705. But in terms of the questions we've already got, so one that's come in is, can we take a trial license to test for ourselves? So yes, we do offer trial licenses. So if that's something you're interested in, please do get in touch and we can look at getting that set up for you. Another one that's come in, perhaps for you, Nikita, this one to answer, how customizable is your software? Uh, the software is very customizable. The presentation that you saw was done through our um, uh, story maps and it's, you choose your theme, you choose your branding, you choose everything. It's all a drag and drop interface. And uh, beautifully, it requires no code, but you could if you wanted to, as you saw with the HSA team. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, it's very flexible and you decide where you want to go with it. Brilliant. Thank you, Nikita. So as I said, do if you have any questions, sub submit them. We've got uh, five minutes left, so if there's anything that you want to ask, do please. Um, so we've had another one come in. Um, are there any specific training or support services available to help familiarise ourselves with the technology? Um, yeah, I'll take that one. So yes is the answer. We offer a wide range of training services, um, be it instructor-led or sort of online courses that you undertake yourselves. So again, if you'd like any more information, do reach out. You can also look up Esri UK Learning Services, and there's lots of information there about the sort of courses we offer. So we've had another one in. This one will probably be for you, Adam. 
do you manage the national data service you described earlier? Do you essentially remove the burden so that we wouldn't have to manage it ourselves? Uh, short answer is yes. So yeah, we, we host, manage and maintain, as I mentioned, those 16,000 indicators and as and when the, the data gets updated from the source, uh, we bring that into the national data service as soon as possible. Brilliant, thank you. We've had another one in, which is for, for you, Bryony, is which instant app template did you use? I can't unmute. <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> um, that is a good question that I should know the answer to. I will find out. <laughs> No problem at all. We'll, we'll take that one away. <laughs> so we've had another one for you, Nikita. Can road distances and travel times be calculated? Yeah, so with what I was showing, the space-specific patient distances, we can calculate driving distance, travel distance, time that it takes, and also costs as well if you wanted to build those in. Brilliant, thank you, Nikita. And I think we've got one final question here, which sort of wraps us up quite well time-wise, is I think we're referring to the data observatory here, Adam, but does it include data on all services offered by the NHS? Um, so that one's well, quite, a, quite a difficult one to answer. Um, obviously, as I say, you, you can add in your, your own data if there is data that we're, we're not able to, to get access to or have not included so far. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, without, I suppose, knowing the specifics, it's hard for me to comment too much more. No problem at all. Thank you for that. So as I said, we are slightly tight for time. So one last thing we just wanted to make you aware of was our next webinar, which is taking place on Wednesday, the 22nd of May at 11 a.m., Transforming Property and Estates Management Through Location Intelligence. So this one will be of particular interest to anyone working within estates and facilities management, as on the webinar we'll be joined by the Estates Project Manager at Airedale Foundation Trust, who will be demonstrating how they utilised a geographic approach to respond to and manage RAC. So it will be a great session and we hope to see many of you there. And you can register directly for that webinar using the QR code on the screen. So lastly, just wanted to thank all of you for your time today and for our speakers for joining us. If you have any further questions or would like any more information about anything you've seen today, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or another member of the Esri UK team. So thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>